Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the speaker series of the Royal Tyrell Museum. This week's speaker is Dr. Elsa Panciroli. Elsa is a Scottish paleontologist, and she went to the University of the Highlands and Islands at Inverness for her undergrad studies. And yes, that is near the famous Loch Ness in Scotland. She did her master's at the University of Bristol under supervision of Christine Giannis, and she completed her PhD at the University of Edinburgh and the National Museum Scotland uh, under co-supervision of Joshi Luo on Jurassic mammals from the Isle of Skye, Scotland. Since then, she's been a researcher at Oxford, at the University Museum and the University. And she's now also a science writer, having written um, many magazines and newspapers. And she's also now published a book, um, The Beast's Beast Before Us, The Untold Story of Mammal Evolution. And this is uh, the topic of today's talk. So Elsa, take it away. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction um, and thank you everyone for coming along to this talk today. So as Femke says, I am going to talk to you about, well, really this story that I tell in my book, Beasts Before Us. So I thought I'd give my uh, brief introduction to who I am and what I do, which kind of gives context for what I'm talking about today as well. So as Femke says, I'm a paleontologist from Scotland. And I'm currently at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History, which is pictured here, uh, where I'm a Leverhulme researcher, but I'm also an associate researcher at National Museum Scotland. So um, the Museum of Natural History in Oxford has these incredible collections. And even though it's actually quite a modest sized museum, um, the collections are really internationally important and historically very, very important because it's one of the oldest museums, um, arguably the oldest museum in the world, although I know that there's several contenders. But anyway, it has a long antiquity and there are over seven million objects in this collection, uh, including the only surviving soft tissue from the, the extinct dodo. So uh, really internationally significant, but more related to this talk. Um, we also have the first dinosaur that was ever described by scientists, Megalosaurus. And at the same time as that dinosaur was described, so was the first mammal from the Jurassic period. Um, and that's in our collection as well. So that's important because my own specialism is in the evolution of mammals. So I study extinct life in general, but I'm particularly interested in the origin and evolution of mammals. So much of the work that I carry out on uh, is on Jurassic mammals that come from the Isle of Skye. Um, so this is a picture of myself and my colleague Roger Benson, um, who is now at the AMNH, uh, working on Skye, which we've been doing for several years now. Um, so these mammals come from the same time period, almost exactly the same time period as the ones that are housed in uh, Oxford. So that's part of the reason that I'm now based there. Now, in the Jurassic Mammals are extremely small. They're the size of, of a mouse or a rat, although obviously they're not rodents at this point because this is much earlier in the mammal family. But I use ultra high resolution CT and synchrotron scanning to study those fossils. So that gets around the problem of the really small size and it lets me reconstruct them in exceptional detail to study them. So, for example, um, I've recently completed work on, on one of the fossils from Skye called Borealestes. And this is a, a pair of reconstructed skulls um, by Matt Humpage, who I do a lot of work with. So these are the most complete mammals from the time of dinosaurs known in the UK and some of the most complete in the world. And as you can see, they're very, very tiny. I don't know if you've ever seen a, a British five pence piece, but it's extremely small. So I'm going to come back to these tiny little guys in the Jurassic uh, slightly later on. But as I've already said, what I'm going to talk about in this uh, talk is really the story that's in my book. Now, it's a popular science book about the origin and evolution of mammals. Um, and these are some of the fantastic photos that people have sent me of them reading the book in various locations around the world. I really love getting these. Um, so please do send me yours if you have one. Now, I've called this the untold story. And that's because it's a tale that I think a lot of people might think they know at least part of. But I'm, I'm willing to bet that you might not have heard the whole story. And in fact, what you might have heard is really the end of the story. What I'm going to talk to you about is the prequel. I'm going to tell you the real origin story, where it kind of all begins, and also how the characteristics that we associate with mammals first appear. 
So I think before I go on, I'm going to just clarify exactly what I mean by a mammal. What does it mean to be a mammal? So we live in the so-called age of mammals. Not that, in fact, there aren't more mammals uh, in terms of vertebrates. There aren't more species of mammals than there are, for example, lizards or birds. In fact, there's many, many more of those. But mammals occupy the widest range of body size and also morphology. Basically, they're the weirdest creatures out there. They're the biggest creatures out there and some of the smallest. And they're doing a lot of the really um, interesting and unique stuff in ecosystems. This is why we call it the age of mammals. So we're talking about everything from bears to uh, platypuses to elk and, of course, humans as well, which is one of the reasons why people have long been so fascinated with where mammals come from. So what makes them mammals? Well, uh, if if I was with you as a live audience and I was to ask you to list some traits that make mammals what they are, probably one of the first ones that you'd say is milk. So mammals produce milk and they're the only animals that produce that produce it. Other creatures produce substances, they feed their young, but it isn't milk. This is a very unique trait to our group. The other thing that, of course, unites mammals is that they possess fur. As you can see from this particularly glamorous horse, some mammals have a lot more fur than others. Um, some humans have a lot more fur than others. But even things like whales, which have secondarily lost their, their hair, lost their fur, they actually still sprout a few whiskers really early in their growth. And these fall out um, as they grow. So some of you uh, may not be aware of another one of our defining features, and that is our ear bones. So other vertebrate animals um, only have a single ear bone, the stapes, and mammals have three. And I'm going to come back to where those come from and why this makes mammals special a little bit later on. But these are three of the sort of main features that uh, you associate with mammals. Of course, there's a suite of other uh, details and anatomical details that we could go into, but these are the main ones. And of course, mammals today fall into three main groups. Uh, we have the placental mammals, that's the largest group, the group to which we belong. Um, and among the things that, that characterise them, one of them is uh, the way in which they develop their young. So they emphasise gestation. In other words, they keep their young in the within the body for a lot longer um, than the next group, which are the marsupials. Slightly smaller group, um, more geographically restricted as well. Um, and they um, very famously give birth to incredibly tiny, tiny young, um, some smaller than a jelly bean. And they emphasise instead um, a long development um, on the nipple, basically, lactation. So they've invested in the lactation side of things, the milk giving. And of course, famously, um, this is, takes place within the marsupium, within the pouch. And then there's the third, and I think possibly the most charming and amazing of the groups, and that's the monotremes. We don't have many of them. There's the platypus and there's a few types of echidna, um, but they are true mammals. They also feed their young on milk, um, but they don't have live birth. They retain this uh, really ancient trait of laying eggs, which some people, of course, will use as an argument to say that they're bizarre or unusual. But um, really, this is actually what all mammals once did. You could argue that it's actually the live birth that's a bit weird. So there you can see a wonderful picture of a couple of uh, very young platypuses in the nest. So they do feed on, they feed their young milk as well, but it's not through a nipple. It's actually exuded through a patch on their, on their tummies. So here we have the three main groups of mammals today. And when you ask people where they come from, most people start the story here. So this is uh, that point, that famous, infamous point, 66 million years ago, at the end of the Cretaceous, when an asteroid was passing through our solar system and it smashed into the Earth. Of course, it famously caused the extinction of the non-bird dinosaurs and marine flying reptiles, but it did wipe out a lot of mammals as well. And if you look at most books written about mammal evolution, particularly uh, for a popular audience, this is where the story almost always begins. And if they, they talk about something before this, it's maybe a throwaway paragraph or two, if you're lucky, a chapter. But really, they make out as if this is when everything gets started. But that's not the story I'm going to tell you, because I think the real beginning of mammals can actually be traced over 250 million years before this point. 
before there were dinosaurs, before there were actually mammals as we have just defined them, mammals as we know them. And also, interestingly, before there were flowers or pine trees, in fact, before there were beetles even. So looking at a simplified diagram um, from my book of the, the broader family to which we belong, uh, mammal evolution often just concentrates on the Cenozoic, on this most recent period. But if we trace our lineage right back, we're part of this much, much larger grouping, the synapsids. And it's the synapsid story that I want to talk about today, because I think to understand who we are and what mammals are, we really need this much bigger. So the story starts here in the Carboniferous. So this is over 320 million years ago. And most of the planet is covered in these dense tropical swamp forests. So it's wet, it's hot. Um, I say forests, but these trees are not trees as we know them. They're not related to, um, to our modern trees. They're more related to things like club moss and quillwort, which today are really small kind of understory plants. But at this point, they grow to over 60 metres tall. They are true trees. Also, this is a time period when we have the highest oxygen levels um, of all time. And it's thought that this contributed to the growth of insects to become truly giant. So we have, for example, millipedes that are the size of motorbikes and uh, dragonflies, well, re early uh, relatives of dragonflies that are as big as seagulls. So this is a truly bizarre version of our planet. It's almost an alien world. Now, by this point, the first backbone animals have, um, have left water and are walking on land. And there are some books that might call these, um, these animals amphibians or reptiles, but they aren't either of those groups. They are, at this point, the correct way to refer to them is tetrapods, so four-limbed animals, backboned animals, because things like amphibians and reptiles hadn't actually um, emerged yet. So you will find in some old textbooks that they might be referred to as amphibians, but it's not really technically correct. So the first group um, to split off from this sort of amorphous group of tetrapods at this time period were the amphibians. Um, so these are um, the anamniotes. So the amniote, uh, that refers to the type of eggs that they have. So as, as you know, things like newts, um, salamanders, frogs, they have these unprotected eggs, the frog spawn, that basically needs water uh, to stay hydrated and for the, the developing embryos to breathe. So this is a really simple way to reproduce and to, uh, to lay your young, but it's incredibly effective, obviously, because we still have many amphibians today. So although it's a, a, an early characteristic to develop, it's a really, really good, um, what's the word, strategy for survival. However, another group emerges later on. So the amphib this is the anamniotes basically break off early and they are the ones that will eventually give rise to what we know as amphibians. And then the remaining ones, these are the amniotes. And this is the group to which synapsids belong, the group to which we actually belong. And they uh, evolve to lay eggs with a tough outer shell. And why is this significant? Well, um, by having a shell, by having some kind of leathery outer covering, it prevents the eggs from drying out. And this means that these early tetrapods, the amniote ones, can actually move away from the water's edge. They're no longer tied to the swamps. So they're able to spread into new landscapes and, um, what's the word, take advantage of uh, new territories. And as the climate changes slightly later on in this period and into the Permian and begins to dry out, it gives them a bit of an advantage. So... The amniote tetrapods then are going to split into two groups, and this is where our story is really going to start. So we have these sort of, I'd like to think of them as sort of two Hogwarts houses. Pick whichever ones you like. I mean, I, you could say Slytherin and Gryffindor if you were biased, but uh, basically the diapsids and the synapsids. So on the one side, you've got the diapsids, which are essentially going to eventually give lies, rise to reptiles. On the other side, the synapsids, which will eventually give rise to mammals. And the way that we tell the difference between them is by looking at the back of the skull. 
So at this point, all the tetrapods probably look kind of relatively similar, I mean, from a non-specialist point of view. So if you wanted to tell the difference, one of the main ways is by looking at the back of the skull. You can see there, I've highlighted in blue, that the synapsids have just one hole behind the eye on each side of the skull, whereas diapsids have two. And it's a very simple definition, and there are caveats actually among the reptile line, but that doesn't really concern us today, because then the synapsid side, it's pretty clear cut. They have just this one hole in the side of the skull. And you can actually still feel that the, what's left of the, rem the remnants of that hole in your own skull. If you would put your fingers on your temple, so just behind your eye, that little hollow there that your muscles run through, that's actually the kind of remnant of this single hole in the skull. So this is where the story, our story, the mammal story kind of really begins. Mammals and reptiles share this common ancestor, but it is neither mammal nor reptile at this point. And what did that um, early, early synapsid look like? Well, we have actually some um, fossil evidence for what it might have looked like. This, for example, is a reconstruction of uh, one of the early synapsids called Echinerpeton. And it comes from uh, Joggins in Nova Scotia. Uh, there's a picture behind that of um, one of the tree stumps of one of those uh, lycopsids, one of those trees I was show just showing you in the previous picture, um, preserved beautifully in the rock there. And uh, there's some amazing fossils of some of these very early synapsids where they're actually curled up inside the tree stumps. Perhaps uh, they perhaps they roosted in there, they nested in there, or maybe they were in search of insects. But um, quite spectacular fossils of some of these little creatures. And superficially, you might look at it and think, oh, it looks like a lizard. But of course, it, it, it's not... Um, it's neither a rept reptile nor exactly a mammal. It's an early ancestor of mammals. So very soon, uh, the, by the end of the Carboniferous and into the Permian, these synapsids begin to grow to become some of the largest backboned animals on Earth. And this is a part of the story that I think quite often gets missed out of our telling of not just mammal history, but really history of life on Earth. So you'll recognise, I'm sure, this creature here. This is one of the most iconic fossils in the world. Um, this is Demetrodon, or the one with the sail in its back, which is what people quite often refer to it as. And this is a giant carnivore. It could grow, some of the species of uh, Demetrodon could grow up to three metres long, so longer than a car. It has this enormous sail in its back, and there's multiple theories for what this was for. Uh, one of the leading theories at the moment really is that it was probably used as some form of display, perhaps to um, intimidate other Demetrodon or to defend territory or maybe even to attract a mate, some kind of display function. Um, we could talk more about some of the other theories, uh, perhaps in the questions at the end. Now, one of the interesting things I always think about Demetrodon is that it is so often thought of as a reptile. Um, it quite often gets lumped in with the dinosaurs. If you've ever seen um, Fantasia, you might notice Demetrodon hanging out with dinosaurs around, uh, I think, around a lagoon in the Jurassic. But of course, it, it firmly predates dinosaurs um, by a good hundred million years. And it is no kind of reptile. This uh, old terminology where we call them mammal-like reptiles is quite misleading and I, I tend to avoid using it because there's no reptile here. This is 100% synapsid. This is on the mammal line. One of our uh, closest relatives on that line right from back at the beginning. And one of the things that I explore in my book is um, the history of some of these fossils is also interesting from the more human perspective. So for example, um, there's a social and political context to Demetrodon, um, something I could only really touch on in this uh, in this talk, but I do explore it further in the book, and I encourage you to explore it um, with whatever fossils you're interested in. So Demetrodon, uh, for example, was found first from the Texas redbeds, which are pictured here. And very famously, it was described by Edward Drinker Cope of Cope and Marsh, Bone Wars, um, but many of his specimens were actually found by, um, so that's Cope there, were actually found by a Swiss American naturalist um, called uh, Jacob Ball. And he passed them on to Cope to be described. So quite often people, when they're tracing these specimens, that's as far back as they go. 
But actually, they were not the first people to find these fossils, not by a long shot. It really, uh, this story ignores the full extent of human discovery in particularly North America, but the same thing takes place elsewhere. Because many of these Texas red bed fossils were discovered um, long before this by indigenous people in North America. For example, the Comanche found them in uh, the same uh, age of outcrops in Oklahoma. And they had their own interpretations um, that were based actually on their really extensive knowledge of animal anatomy. I mean, they recognised a lot of the time what these bones were, if not exactly what animal uh, they belonged to, um, because they understood anatomy from, um, you know, from their own hunting and butchering of animals. So I think this is there's a lot of stories like this to uncover with fossils and, and people are beginning to do this. So, yeah, I encourage you to do similar, to look into this sort of story in whatever group you're interested in. Right. I want to move on now to what I've kind of dubbed the first age of mammals. So I just said about how the reason we're in the age of mammals now is that they have the widest range of body sizes and the most diverse ecologies. Well, our synapsid ancestors actually did that. Um, in the Permian over 252 million years ago. So we've got the major group called the synapsids. And within that, we then have uh, the sort of next Russian doll down, and that's the therapsids. So they emerge uh, in the Permian and they basically become the most diverse and successful tetrapods on the planet at that time, more so than their rep the reptile line uh, counterparts, who, of course, are also developing in this time period. And they include some enormous animals, as large as today's cows or buffalo, and built like sumo wrestlers. I mean, these creatures are gigantic. These are some of the planet's first dedicated herbivores. And being a herbivore is actually quite tricky, especially for a bigger animal, because plants are very hard to digest. Um, and where you have large herbivores, you can always expect that you also find large carnivores. And so it is we have some of the first really big, I mean, the size of sort of tigers, these uh, these gorgonopsians feeding on some of these really early mega herbivores. Um, so for example, well, I'll come back in a second and talk about Gorgonops in a little bit more detail. And as well as this, some of these therapsids are also, we have the earliest tree climbers, we have dedicated diggers, and we also have a few that are going to eventually give rise to um, the line that we belong to, the cynodonts. But I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Now, there's some evidence that these animals at least some lineages of them were already warmer blooded. So their temperatures were beginning to elevate in some lineages. Um, there's also evidence that some of them might have been nocturnal um, and that perhaps they even had the first whiskers and hair. And I'll come back to that as well in a little moment. So here we have all of these animals and they're flourishing in these early ecosystems on our planet over 100 million years before the first dinosaurs appear. So in my book, as I say, I call this the, the true first age of mammals, even though I know technically they're not quite mammals yet, but they are the mammal line. And they're taking the majority of niches in the ecosystem at this time period. So I want to have a quick look at two of my favourites out of this lineup. Um, so this, uh, the first one here is Estemenosuchus. Um, so the original fossil is held in the uh, PIN, the Paleontological Institute in Moscow. The animal itself was about three metres long. It was vegetarian. And as you can see, it's a really handsome chap. <laughs> it's got these horns that come not only out of the top of its head, but out of the side of its cheeks as well. I mean, it really is just the most extraordinary, extraordinary looking creature. Uh, also, what makes this such an interesting animal, an interesting fossil, is that there is reportedly a specimen that has skin. This is the um, picture of it as reported in um, one of the Russian journals. And if this is true, this skin is really quite revealing because it appears to be quite glandular, which is what you would expect from something that was on the mammal line rather than the reptile line. So there's no scales here. So although these are sometimes called mammal-like reptiles, there's nothing reptilian about their skin. Um, so that's the first one. And it's one of the oldest, um, if not the oldest, skin preserved in the fossil record. 
And then the other one I wanted to focus on quickly, uh, just to talk again about some extraordinary things about these creatures, is Gorgonops. So this picture here is actually a closely related um, species, a genus called Lysenops, and it's in the Field Museum in Chicago. And the reason that I bring this up is because a lot of the Gorgonopsians, the group that these belong to, they are the first animals to develop saber teeth. Uh, of course, saber teeth are more famous in saber tooth cats, which are a much more recent um, evolutionary uh, development. But here they are over 252 million years ago. These are really uh, specialized hunters. They're fast moving. Their limbs are already beginning to be drawn under the body rather than be sprawling. And there's some evidence from their bones, from the histology of their bones, that they had a faster metabolism. So these creatures are really quite recognizably um, mammal-like, even at this point. Of course, it's not just their um, bones that are preserved, but of course they've left their footprints in the fossil record as well. And actually, this is one of the, the my first encounters with these beasts of the Permian was in studying footprints in this quarry in Scotland, which is called Clashach. Um, now, some of these footprints from this uh, this quarry and quarries in elsewhere in Scotland of the same um, time period, they're some of the first fossil footprints that were um, described by scientists. And originally, these footprints, um, here's what they look like. Originally, they were thought to be made by tortoises. And there are some very interesting experiments where tortoises were made to walk over uh, wet pie crust to see what kind of um, footprints they need. But of course, we now know that these footprints belong to creatures like the ones that we've just been talking about. Um, and the similar footprints are found in sites across uh, North and South America and other parts of the world. Many of those footprints belong to synapsids and some of them to, uh, of course, the, re the reptiles that are also living alongside them. So this is an incredible time period, an incredible world and the first flourishing of the synapsid line. But as so often happens in the fossil record, this is when disaster strikes. So in, in what is now Siberia in Russia, 252 million years ago, volcanoes begin to erupt and they erupt on a scale that has never been seen before or since. They poured out over 3 million cubic tons of lava. So this covered an area of um, probably they estimate over 7 million square kilometres beneath um, a, basically a deadly blanket of lava. And that was destructive enough on its own. But what was even worse was, of course, the amount of ash and gas that was erupted alongside this lava. So this, um, this kind of ash cloud would have cut out sunlight. In the, in the shorter term, it would have killed plant life, starved those plant eaters, and, of course, in turn, the animals that fed on them. Um, and of course, these uh, gases uh, from volcanoes include greenhouse gases like sulfur and carbon dioxide. And we know only too well, thanks to our current climate crisis, what happens when greenhouse gases are released too quickly into the atmosphere. Um, so the sulfur, for example, bound with water vapour to create acid rain. And the carbon dioxide levels rose to the highest that have ever been seen in history of life on Earth. Um, if you were to dip your toe into the sea at the equator um, during this time period, it would have been as hot as a bath at home, you know, your bubble bath in the evening. It would have been unbearable for most life on Earth. And sure enough, about 85% um, of life on the planet uh, died out at this time. So it was the largest mass extinction event uh, that we know of of all time. Um, on our planet, on the land and in the sea. And that's particularly significant because quite often extinctions are localised to particular areas or perhaps they're terrestrial or marine, but here it was both. And this graph, um, this is quite a famous graph showing extinction levels rising and falling through time. And extinction, of course, is a natural part of life. It happens very regularly, as you can see here. Um, on average, it's been estimated a species probably exists for a few million years at most before disappearing or being replaced by descendants. But as you can see in this graph, there are these times when extinction levels rise really sharply. And those are, of course, mass extinctions. Five of them are known as the big five. Uh, these are the ones that have been identified by scientists um, who basically they use mathematical analysis to look at the extinction of life through deep uh, geological time. 
And the N. Cretaceous mass extinction is probably the most famous one, but you can see here it's far from the largest. Um, in fact, it's pretty average as giant mass extinctions go. Um, now, of course, we are currently facing the sixth mass extinction. Where exactly this is going to fall on that chart remains to be seen. Hopefully, if we take action, um, it will only be a minor blip and not one of not a major mass extinction. So this takes us neatly into the Triassic. And basically, our planet's kind of been wiped clean and the clock has been restarted again, biologically speaking, you know, in terms of evolution. And a lot of that flourishing, these complex ecosystems, these incredible mega herbivores and carnivores, they're gone. They've been wiped out. And of course, very famously in the Triassic, it's the reptiles that then are kind of first off the mark and become the most prolific and uh, the most diverse in terms of their body plan and in terms of their ecology for the next 180 million years. But it's not obviously the end for the synapsids or for the therapsids that have uh, that have appeared before this. One of, um, in fact, in the uh, immediate aftermath of the mass extinction, it's actually once again one of our relatives uh, that does really, really well. And it's this creature called Lystrosaurus, which is pictured here, the two larger creatures. Um, for a while, Lystrosaurus become the most common backboned animals on the planet. They're referred to as disaster taxa. Um, so disaster taxa are uh, creatures that basically do really, really well and flourish in the aftermath of um, a kind of disaster, like a mass extinction, but they usually don't do well in the long term. And decinodonts, um, like Lystrosaurus, are really, uh, like they're quite bizarre creatures. They must be, I think they are, the only animals that have, uh, backboned animals that have developed both tusks and a beak. Like, it just seems like they're being greedy to me. But they're plant eaters. Um, they li did live in the late Permian and made it through into the Triassic. Um, this image here actually comes from a study by somebody called Egerna Solis, um, who was a female researcher here in Oxford in the 19th century. And she and her father used uh, a technique called serial grinding to study uh, the skull of dicynodonts. And this was a, basically the predecessor of CT scanning. But of course, it did involve, as the name suggests, serially grinding fossils down in order to see what was inside them. So it was also a destructive process. <clears throat> so these tusk beaked creatures, um, they make it through. Um, and not just that, but they survive throughout the Triassic and they do end up actually giving rise to um, the largest synapsid lineage animals um, until the modern day. These creatures um, pictured here with a human for scale, have been found in Poland in the late Triassic. I'm probably going to murder the name that is called Lizvicha. And it is essentially um, an elephant-sized dicynodont that flourished in the late Triassic of Poland. So the mammal lineage or their, their relatives did really quite well in this time period. But as I say, as we know, um, the Mesozoic, the Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous, they are the age of reptiles. And uh, these incredible dicynodonts with their bizarre tusk-beak combo um, become extinct by the end of the Triassic. But the mammal story is far from over. It's actually, this is it just basically coming to the fore. This is when it really takes off and we get mammals, mammals that are recognisably mammalian. Because you'll notice in, um, on that log in this picture is a little furry dude. And that is the one that we're now going to concentrate on. So back in that uh, tableau I showed you of all the animals in the, in, in the Permian, you, uh, we spoke about Procynosuchus, this little creature here. They, Procynosuchus first appeared at the end of the Permian, and it was very widespread. It's found in Russia, Europe, Zambia, South America. Um, it's been suggested that it was probably a capable swimmer and a good digger. Um, and it's descendants, they make it through this end Permian mass extinction. Also interesting is I mentioned the earliest evidence for um, fur, uh, for hair in the fossil record. You see this, um, this artistic depiction of Procynosuchus shows it with some fur on its body. 
And that's because um, there's evidence like this. This is possibly a single hair found in the coprolite, the fossilised dung of a predator from the Permian, possibly belonging to an animal like Procynosuchus. Now, it's been argued it's a hair. Some people think it might actually be um, a strand of fungus. But if it is a hair, it shows that at this time period that there were whiskers and hair on some of these creatures, very likely creatures like Procynosuchus. Um, so we have slightly more solid evidence for the appearance of things like whiskers a little bit later on in a creature called Thranaxodon. So this is um, one of the later descendants of animals like Procynosuchus. It's a cynodont, and we are cynodonts. We are now basically, this is the group that we belong to that we're talking about. Um, Thranaxodon is really well known from the fossil record. There's some um, quite stunning fossils of it. And it's uh, studying these fossils that has allowed us to trace the origin, not only potentially of the first whiskers, um, but also of where uh, milk appears in the mammal story. So some of the evidence for the appearance of both milk and whiskers comes from um, studies like this, uh, which was done by uh, Benoit et al. a few years ago. In this case, you're seeing the skull of, of a thranaxodon, and it has been rendered uh, using uh, synchrotron scanning, I believe. And what's highlighted there is one of the structures within the, um, the maxilla, the upper jaw. Now, what you see there in pink is what's called the infraorbital foramen. So it's a hole in the, on, in the skull and the maxillary canal is what's green and is coming out of that hole and snaking along the skull. Now, the reason this is significant is that um, that maxillary canal, the green structure, is really complex and branched. And so what this study suggested is that this is evidence that there was probably whiskers in this animal because animals with whiskers, of course, need really good blood supply and a supply of nerves in order to translate the, um, the sensitivity of their whiskers to the brain. So in other words, if you've got whiskers, you're going to need lots of nerves and blood vessels. So this is sort of really good way of getting at something that's actually a soft tissue characteristic and you can't really see it in any other fossils. But there's another thing that um, gives us a hint that at this time period, um, not only did they have fur, but they also potentially were producing milk. And it comes from this structure that you see here on an amphibian and a reptile, the parietal eye or third eye. Now, reptiles and amphibians still have this little hole in the top of their skull, the parietal eye, but mammals don't. And they actually lose this feature um, at around about the time of Thranaxodon. Now, there are um, some humans and other animals that do redevelop a hole in top of the skull. And studies on uh, mice in the laboratory have shown that this can occur when there's a particular mutation in a gene, a homeogene called MSX2. And when this mutation occurs, laboratory mice have a foramen in their skull. And then they also have deficiencies in hair follicle maintenance and the production of milk. They also fail to, to develop um, their brain in the same way. So it kind of shows you that these things are all linked, that in some way, hair maintenance and milk and this hole in the skull all kind of go together in the same set of genes. So it could be that in the fossil record, when we see the foramen in the head close, that could also indicate that we also are seeing possibly the first production of, or at least the predecessors to milk production. And this takes place in the late Triassic. So it's really quite exciting to be able to look at these, these hard tissue features and get at something as difficult to identify as the origin of milk. So let's move forward because now we're gonna talk about the first, um, well, not quite true mammals, but just outside the group of really true mammalians, the mammalia forms. So by the end of the Triassic and into the early Jurassic, dinosaurs, of course, are flourishing. But so are mammals. While dinosaurs are kind of, you know, becoming huge and taking over all of this massive eco, uh, eco space, mammals, it's almost like they sit and think, well, you know, dinosaurs have got big covered. What could we do that would be different and interesting? And what they do is they become extremely small. So 
200 million years ago in this world filled with giant reptiles, mammals begin to uh, evolve to, they are much, much smaller. And this actually changes everything about the architecture of their bodies and their senses. And as a result, it forges them into the animals that we know today. So it's true they were small, probably um, around the size, a lot of them were around the size of you know, shrews or mice. Easily they would curl up in the palm of your hand. They were almost certainly insectivorous. Uh, they were probably also nocturnal. And we know this because of the loss of photoreceptors in mammal eyes. Um, but what they also teach us is that big is not always better. In this case, becoming very small was not a relegation, it was an innovation. Some of the most successful groups today are the smallest. So there are, um, well, estimates vary as to how many mammals species there are today, but 80% of the mammals that we have on Earth today are small rodents and bats. It's a really good way of life. But when you're nocturnal, you also, uh, you need to navigate the world in the dark. So at this time period, uh, these mammals definitely have whiskers and they also begin to develop a much more um, accurate sense of smell. So we see the parts of the brain that process smell begin to grow in some of these early mammals. Um, so their whiskers are super sensitive to touch. They become the smelliest animals. There's these olfactory bulbs in their brain grow. Um, but smallness also is key to something I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, and that is the development of this really complex ear. So studies have shown that um, as the mammals have become small in this time period, they've re there's constraints released uh, at the back of their jaw. So their jaws up until this point are made of multiple bones. In this uh, picture, you can see in the top jaw there, these bones are coloured in orange. Um, up until this point, mammal jaws are made of multiple bones, but at this point, they begin to um, shrink the bones at the back of the jaw, and those bones become incorporated into the ear. And the result is that mammals have ended up with this incredible range of hearing, everything from the really ultra high frequencies of bats to the ultra low frequencies of things like whales um, and elephants today. So these changes that are taking place in the late Triassic and early Jurassic really allow us to forge mammals as we know them. And up until um, the last 20 years, we thought that that was kind of, you know, little small ratty insect eaters were all that mammals were at this time period. But now, thanks to fossils, um, particularly from places like China, more complete body fossils with um, the postcranial skeleton, we also know that mammals um, were not just restricted to that single niche, they were actually really ecologically diverse. And when we start to look um, around the world, we're starting to see some that are um, flyers, well, gliders, like flying squirrels. We have specialist diggers, docophosser, for example, which is basically a Jurassic mole. We have dedicated tree, uh, tree climbers, and we even have dedicated uh, semi-aquatic mammals at this time period. So in other words, in the Jurassic and into the Cretaceous, these mammals, although still restricted in body size, none were bigger than uh, sort of a badger, they're, they're more or less as diverse as mammals of the same size are today in the time of dinosaurs. And what's more, they're even kind of turning our whole idea of ecosystems on their head. For example, this fossil here is called Repenimamus. It comes from the early Cretaceous. And when, uh, it, so in this picture, the tail is at the bottom of the fossil, the skull is at the top. And what's in the middle there is the stomach contents. And when researchers examine those stomach contents, they realize that they uh, comprise the bones of baby dinosaurs. So in the early Cretaceous, mammals were eating dinosaurs. Oh, that's disappeared. Mammals were actually eating dinosaurs. So this is turning all of our ideas about mammals in the time of dinosaurs on their head. And we're kind of coming really to what I would see as almost like the conclusion of the story. So the next uh, big event in mammal evolution is um, the emergence of flowering plants. Um, so this takes place in the early to mid Cretaceous. And it really transforms the entire planet because up until this point, we didn't have 
flowering plants um, on Earth. But when flowers begin to develop, that also means that we begin to have pollen, um, which of course gives rise to a, a, a nectar, which gives rise to this huge diversity of pollinating insects. And then, of course, eventually we're going to end up with fruits and nuts and seeds. And it opens up all of this ecological space. And mammals are one of the groups that really takes advantage of this. So we see uh, on this diagram here, the Cretaceous Terrestrial Revolution, KTR, is that band down the centre of the diagram. And directly after this time period, that's, that's the time period when flowering plants exist, we see all of the mammal groups alive at that time begin to explode in terms of the diversity. Um, and including, of course, those that would give rise to the groups that are alive today. Um, I should say a slight caveat to this story that our uh, closer relatives didn't actually look that interesting and exciting at this point in time. Um, a lot of them are the classic sort of um, shrew-like mammals, the cliche. Um, but uh, a study that I did recently with a few colleagues looking at this shows that there's our group here. They are they remain kind of a little bit shrew-like and a little bit boring. And a lot of the really exciting stuff was actually taking place in their very close relatives, the ones that had branched before them. And that's significant because of what, of course, is going to happen next in the story, and that is the mass extinction. So here we are again, 66 million years ago, where our story, um, in my opinion, ends, or at least it, we, it concludes and then leads into the story that you kind of already know. So the end of the Cretaceous, uh, the non-bird dinosaurs, of course, are wiped out, but so are a lot of those other groups of mammals, leaving behind the mammals that would... Um, end up giving rise to the diversity of uh, mammal life today. And often you get this moment in time told in a very dramatic Hollywood apocalypse style uh, sort of way. But let's just imagine for a moment these creatures that have been building up until this point, all the way from the Carboniferous. And from a mammal's point of view, many of them are small, many of them are burrowers. They perhaps uh, would really not really have been that much affected by what was going on up on the surface. They could have, for all we know, they could have been hibernating. They might not have even noticed. In fact, when they came up for air, maybe they're thinking, wow, there's loads of really great dead bodies that I can nibble bits of. Um, you know, they there's a good reason why they made it through. Um, also, of course, they had a covering of hair and they were endothermic. So if climate was fluctuating wildly, if we had a nuclear winter, um, it's quite likely that they would have fared better than other animals. And of course, they take care of their young as well. So they can get them through hard times in a way that um, some animal groups can't. Uh, so I'll finish by just saying that, of course, there's lots of research into exactly how uh, mammals diversified. Did they, di did they begin to diversify before or after this mass extinction? Um, or perhaps uh, they, they exploded in diversity quickly, or maybe it was a long fuse of steady increase. And I think really we don't really know exactly the answer. We don't have the answer and fossils and DNA don't agree um, as to the pattern of how um, they diversified. But one thing we do know for sure is that they made it through um, and that we now have this age of mam mammals with the largest reptiles gone um, and mammals swiftly moving in to once again take over um, all of that ecological space. So I hope I've convinced you um, in this talk that mammals have their roots long before um, perhaps you might have thought. And that with each mass extinction, it's really just a lottery as to which group does well and populates and takes over, as it were. And first it was those early synapses and therapsids, then it was reptiles, most recently it was mammals. Who knows, after the sixth mass extinction, if uh, we don't get it in check, will it be mammals or will it be reptiles or will it be maybe amphibians who do the best when the clock restarts next time. Only time will tell. So thank you all so much for listening. Um, and thank you to everyone who made my book possible. And of course, thank you for inviting me to come and talk to you today. Um, if you have any questions, I'd love to try and answer them. Thank you so much, Elsa. I, I love the idea of mammals basically taking a nap, waking up <laughs> and the world is exploded. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> 
the OG yeah. preppers were the mammals. Um, <laughs> before we go on to questions, I would just like to say uh, to everybody, uh, tune in next week for Dr. Emily Bamforth with Ecosystem Jenga, what tiny fossils tell us about a massive extinction. Um, again, organized by the Royal Terrell Cooperating Society. So um, on to the questions. We have some questions, Elsa. Um, hmm. I think I will just go and uh, go through them uh, in chronological order. Okay. Um, Karthik asks, okay, he, he jumps in and he asks a technical question. Will modifications of the hyoid and the palatine in early multitude Sorry, that's a tongue twister, isn't it? Multi tuberculates <laughs> and morganucodontids imply that milk feeding would have evolved in these basal taxa. Ah, okay. So, what they're referring to there is, um, well, a few different things, but there was this really great study um, a couple of years ago um, looking at hyoid bones, and those are the bones that are um, in the throat, basically. And um, quite often when you see skeletons in museums, the hyoid bones are not attached, but we should have a little thin set of bones there and most, um, most mammals. So it's thought that these bones are involved in the ability to kind of suck and to suckle. Um, so yeah, it seems that these bones kind of first appear really early in the, in the lineage of mammalia forms, which are the ones I was talking about that became very, very small just before true mammals emerge. But we don't really see them, as far as I'm aware, we don't see any earlier than that. Um, so I guess what you're kind of asking is, surely you'd expect to see them if there was milk? Uh, and can we use their appearance to indicate whether there's milk or not? Well, I would say not quite, because if you remember the platypus, for example, um, today it still exudes milk from these patches in the skin. So it's very likely that that might be the sort of way that the very earliest milk givers um, produced milk. They might have been just exuded through the skin, in which case you wouldn't need to suckle because you could just lick. So it's possibly not the kind of um, open and close sort of answer to identifying whether there's milk giving or not. Um, I hope that answers the question. Cool. Um, so uh, a couple more technical questions uh, from the same <laughs> person oh, no. who really got, <laughs> yeah, so you've inspired people. That's excellent. Um, okay, does the advent of the cladoic eggs in amniotes also coincide with other major physiological changes, like, for example, transitioning from the three-chambered hearts onto the four chambered hearts hmm um i right so i don't i can't don't know the answer but i do know that of course we're talking about um soft tissue traits so as far as i'm aware we don't really know when that when the heart structure kind of emerged because i don't think as far as i'm aware that there's any way of detecting that in um in fossils because you'd really have to have of course the soft tissue preserved so as far as i'm aware there's no way to answer that question at the moment um but if anybody knows differently please you know please do let me know but i think that would be a very difficult thing to correlate uh, with any of these soft tissue traits including fur and milk but also the structures of organs and things in any group not just mammals um it's just so difficult to know where they come from and we can assume that you know the some structures probably have a very old evolutionary origin but we actually can't really know for certain unless there's some kind of correlate in the actual body of the animal um like i talked about there with the hole in the skull which is a really great way that we can it's still only an inference but we can infer quite you know quite strongly and feel quite confident um but if there's nothing like that then it's very hard to tell it's the bane of our paleontological existence, soft tissue preservation. Yeah, I know. If we could just find one of everything in a Lagerstata, that would be great. <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, do we find any evidence for tooth differentiation among dinocephalians and dicynodonts? Hmm. Well, I mean, so in dicynodonts, of course, we've got the the tusk, um, which is is a tooth differentiation. Um, a lot of the later dicynodonts, so those are the ones with the tusk and the beak, a lot of the later ones begin to lose um, quite a lot of their dentition. Um, 
So, yeah, I mean, I guess the, the answer is yes, but I guess what you, it depends what you mean by tooth differentiation. So certainly in therapsids, and we saw the saber tooth, for example, gorgonopsians, you already begin to see that there are some lineages that do start specialising and their teeth begin to become um, very um, precisely uh, evolved for whatever it is that they're doing. But if you mean in the mammalian way, where we have this very precise occlusion and you actually get this very tight fit between uppers and lowers, that doesn't really happen until the mammalia forms, at least. So that's around about the late Triassic. Before that, there's some nice occlusion um, between certain group, you know, in certain groups, but not to the extent. And of course, that's because in these earlier groups, they're still having continual replacement of the teeth, like you would see um, in, in reptiles as well. Whereas by the time we get to the early uh, mammalia forms in the early uh, Jurassic, these are the first ones that only have a single replacement like we do. They have baby teeth and they have adult teeth. And the reason that they reduce to that one replacement is to keep this really good occlusion. And if you have really nice occlusion, you can start to specialise in uh, very complex um, foodstuffs. You know, you can start to process food that you maybe wouldn't be able to eat uh, otherwise. Cool. Um, and still, still on the same topic, uh, do histological studies on therapsids show a live fast, die young model? Or were they mm. long living? Okay, so the live fast, die young thing is, so in modern mammals now, We'll tend to see that in very small animals, they have this sort of strategy of um, having very short lifespans, getting everything done really quickly, reproducing really quickly and dying quite quickly. So something like a shrew might only live to a year old, um, but they're very busy in that year. <laughs> Whereas uh, bigger animals like elephants, much more protracted growth uh, over long, long time periods. And to date, we don't really see that pattern very strongly in in these earlier groups, in the therapsids and in the synapsids. Um, but again, it, it, the thing is that it's like with every one of these features and every one of these types of growth or whether it's um, whether it's endothermy or whatever you're looking at, uh, it's very easy to say, you know, it is present or it isn't present, but actually probably the degree to which it's present varies in different groups. So I mentioned in those Permian beasts, some of them might have had elevated uh, temp body temperatures, but not all of them. It was not like a, a you know a blanket thing. So it's not that one ancestor has it and then all of the rest of them have it. It might actually evolve independently in different groups. Um, so yeah, we see that with really every aspect of the biology of animals. So yeah, I wouldn't want to give a blanket yes or no, but um, generally speaking, that live fast, die young thing is is much more of a mammalian thing. It takes place a lot later on. Um, and actually some of the work I'm doing just now is trying to narrow down when exactly that emerges and how it emerges. Cool. Um, next one is actually more of a, a compliment than a question. <laughs> oh, lovely. Um, yeah, really enjoyed it. Looking forward to reading your book, says oh. Lucia. That's that's excellent. Um, one last one, and before we go to other question askers, did the split between Afrotheria and Laurasia theory occur during the KTR? Ah, uh, so the timing of all of these of the splits of the modern mammal groups is really debated. Um, so if, if you ask a different mammal researcher, you'll get a different answer from each one of them, depending on on what they kind of favour in terms of the evidence. So the problem is that. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you know, the evidence you get from DNA and the evidence you get from fossils very rarely fits perfectly together. So there have been major papers that have come out saying that all of the modern mammal splits took place before the mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous. Other papers that say absolutely not, it definitely takes place afterwards. And then there's some in between that say, well, these groups split before, these groups split after. I kind of personally take the view that... Um, that every time a new bit of evidence comes out, <laughs> everybody changes their mind. So I'm not wed to any particular theory. I I, I find it a very interesting topic uh, of discovery, but I don't think there's a single answer. I don't think anybody's compellingly convinced me anyway that they are definitely right. Um, there's still a lot more research to be done. 
that science for you. It, it keeps changing every time. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, Megan asks, can you give a definitive time period where when we get true mammals? Oh, time period. Yeah. So um, I can. Yeah. The, well, I can and I can't. So the <laughs> crown mammals um, appear, the, the way you would draw that back is by looking at, of course, the monotremes, the placental mammals and the marsupials and going back in time. So the problem with that is that we don't know when exactly the monotremes split off from the rest of um of the rest of mammals so dna tells us that they are as sort of 160 million years plus is when they probably split from the rest of mammals so that would be the origin of crown mammalia um but it's like 160 million years and then some studies put it like over 200 million years so that's I guess geologically speaking, that's not a big time period, but I think realistically speaking, I mean, that's a huge error bar. Um, so somewhere in that time period is where we, we can place the origin of crown mammals. But again, as with all things, um, there's a couple of different arguments about when exactly it might be. But I think really realistically, we can say, I would say early Jurassic is probably safe to say. Middle Jurassic, definitely. All the cool things happens happen in the early to middle Jurassic. Yeah, I mean, I mean a late Triassic and early Jurassic <laughs> are just brilliant time periods, apparently. <laughs> um, Ailey also asks to follow up on that. Uh, uh, what is the first confirmed member of Mammalia? Um, what's the earliest confirmed member of Mammalia? I'm trying to think what the uh, definitive earliest one is. I don't want to say because I'm going to get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I can't remember, I, there's several, and I can't remember which one is the oldest. Um, give me five minutes, and I will uh, come back to you on that. <laughs> cool. Um, Ian asks: Is there any evidence about how widely spread parental care was within the pre-mammal lineage? Oh, that's a really good question. Mm. How do I answer that? I don't think that we really do know. Uh, so, right. So what we do know is that, first of all, there are there are virtually no um, there's virtually no evidence for how um, mammals took care of their young at the very beginning. So like in the Jurassic, for example. But we do have fossils of some of their closest sort of outgroup members, um, which are called tritylodontids. There's some amazing fossils from the Kayenta uh, formation of Kayentotherium, um, which is one of these tritylodontids. And it's an adult animal with a whole bunch of its babies um, underneath it. And I forget, there's something ridiculous, like 30 babies or something like that. It's a huge number. But what's really interesting about it is not only is there a huge number of them, but they're also, they're just like miniature adults. And that's not really what mammalians look like when they're young. If you think of, well, particularly human babies, but a lot of mammals, they when they're young, they're quite sort of helpless. They have much bigger heads and short faces and, you know, wee, wee arms and great big feet that they're going to grow into. They don't look like adults. You know, they look quite different. But these little creatures don't look like that. They look like miniature adults, which is more what you see in the reptile lineage, for example. So that would kind of suggest that up until that point, that's that's the kind of uh, way that a lot of these earlier predecessors of mammals probably grew, that they they had a very similar to reptiles. They, they hatched out of eggs, they became little versions of adults and they grew up to become adults. Um, at least that's what we infer. And then at some point in these early mammalia forms and mammalia and mammalians, it changes and we begin to get this, this different pattern where the young have these, you know, big skulls, short faces, everything we recognize today. Exactly how that happened and when that happened, we don't yet know. But there is there's some really cool research taking place just now trying to pin that timing down. Um, but it's certainly going to be, again, almost certainly going to be in the Jurassic when all the cool stuff happens. Um, Dino comes with a speculative question. What is the oh. most likely tetrapod group to evolve next? As in there are oh. reptiles, birds and amphibians. Do you mean uh, to kind of take over and become the next uh, um, intelligent? 
I, I think so. Mm, That's so I have been asked this before, so I've given it quite a lot of thought. And I guess I can answer what I would like to see the next, the next successful civilization if humans disappear. I would like it to be the corvids, the crows um, and relatives. I could quite see them building an absolutely amazing civilization. That's the terrestrial civilization, of course, because obviously in the sea, there'll be the octopod civilization. I mean, it goes without saying. <laughs> Cool. It's very speculative. I mean, as for what will evolve next, like, period, as in what might evolve next, I think there's really no way to speculate. We can look at the effects of climate change on animals today and, and how that's, what natural selection that's placing on them. Um, and we can speculate about the sorts of things that will be advantageous, like being able to cope with extreme heat, with lack of water, things like that. But... Um, that that's kind of again it's speculative and it doesn't we don't really know exactly what the effects are going to be uh, we can only just sort of um predict it based on what's happened in previous mass extinctions and i'd also guess anything that's big will not make it right yeah being big is not really uh very advantageous if you want to make it through a mass extinction um being well small to medium sized and not a specialist um, is the best thing, <laughs> the best thing to be. Um, Anas asks, you told us about the fact that very early synapsids were in a lot of different ecological niches. Some were even flying. <laughs> were there also some whose way of life was linked to water, like swimming? So um, uh, there were none that we know of that were gliding or flying or anything in that point. Um, but there were specialist climbers. Um, and there, are, so there's some evidence that there are some that are quite good at swimming, but not to the extent of being necessarily like semi-aquatic things like that. The swimming thing is an interesting question because a lot of the a lot of the correlates that you get in the skeleton that are that are associated with swimming are also the same things that you might see in a digger. So it's very difficult looking at the fossil record quite often to unpick those two ecological um, specializations. And the other thing about swimming is I remember somebody saying to me that if you throw any animal in a pond, they can swim. So virtually every animal on the planet can swim, whether they like swimming <laughs> and whether they do it habitually is a, is a different question. Um, so, yeah, I, as far as I'm aware, correct me if I'm wrong, anyone out there, I don't think there's any real specialised swimmers. But there's some evidence that some of the animals might have been quite capable swimmers. Um, Thomas asks, is part of the problem deciding when mammal groups like Laurasia theria, Apotheria, Xenarthia split is the poorly constrained phylogeny of Paleocene fossil mammals, um, which is highly, still highly debated? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's part, part of the issue because some of those paleo, paleogene, early Paleogene mammals um, probably are the earliest members of some of the modern groups. And without being able to tell what's what, it definitely does muddy muddy the waters. But I mean, the main problem is this kind of disparity between what the, the uh, fossil evidence seems to be showing and what the genetics seem to be showing. And the genetics do very often seem to show a much earlier proliferation of these groups and splitting of these groups whereas the first fossils are are not showing that that's not always the case but that's quite often the case um so yeah uh, definitely it doesn't help the the more clear the fossil record can be the easier our job is of piecing it back together again there's oh, nice. actually and i should say as well that there's some people doing amazing work on those early paleogene mammals um yeah maybe worth hunting down someone to do a talk at some point will be good to think about for next year's uh, speaker series indeed Definitely. um one last technical question you're you're being grilled <laughs> on all your technical knowledge um, <laughs> oh, no. um does herbivory arise back again in the mammalia forms or were they solely insectivorous until the kpg boundary um and were they gregarious gregarious i'm not sure what you mean by gregarious? I mean, so the herbivory thing is really interesting. Um, so 
I, earlier I talked about these tritylodontids that are just this outgroup to the mammalia forms. Um, and some of them are specialized. In fact, most of them are really specialized herbivores. So herbivory happens multiple times in different groups all the way through the evolutionary history of, of synapsids. Um, in mammals and mammalia forms, it looks like all of those earlier ones were most likely to be insectivorous, but there's a couple of groups like the um, haramiodins and uh, uh, the multituberculates, the really early ones that look like they may have been uh, more herbivorous. Um, I think the thing, yeah, the, there's two issues. One is that even the classification, a herbivore, an insectivore, a carnivore, no animal well, few animals are actually just that one thing, particularly non-carnivores. They quite often will eat multiple things. I mean, even uh, even cows occasionally will grab and eat a mouse if it's running by. I mean, it's kind of crazy that things that different animals will eat, you see like little birds on the bird table will peck at one another and actually eat uh, flesh as well. So yeah, so the, the distinctions between the different categories of diet are actually not as solid as we make out when we use these terms. So I guess the reason I'm saying that is because I think that there's probably a lot of flexibility in what some of these early animals can eat, even if their teeth seem specialised for something like eating insects, that doesn't preclude that some lineages or even just generally they might have eaten some other things. Um, but yeah, there are some specialised groups that seem to be going down that route of being really, really superb herbivores um, quite early on in the mammal uh, lineage. Cool. I think those were all your questions. <laughs> I, I, hope think I, it's, I, I hope I didn't ramble too much. It's when you, you know. <laughs> it's been very informative. And I think I like the speculation about, you know, you take a lot of thinking about, OK, what will be the next sort of earth superpower and also I, I very much like to take home message of you know not everybody is a specialist I see this with the mosasaurs a lot like they are very generalists um in in reptiles you see this as well you see crocodiles eating fruit um for instance and uh, yeah as you say cows yeah. eating eating meat if they can so um yeah that's uh, that's a nice take home message um Thanks once again. I, I was asked to stress that next week's session is on a Wednesday, not a Thursday, for those of you who want to tune in, but we'll be advertising it on our social media channels as well, I'm sure. Elsa, thank you so much. And um, thank you for having me. It's been a yeah. pleasure. It's been lovely. And uh, yeah, we will we will now let you go and, and relax after this, this grilling uh, question <laughs> session. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much. Thank you.